Okay, good morning. Today we're just going to have a little reminder of things we already know about RNA that we learned in the cell and molecule class. Now throughout, you're going to not need to know all the detail on the slides. We're just looking for a basic reminder overview, and I'll point out some of the important things that you really do need to know. Okay, so remember the central dogma. DNA is used to create RNA, which is then used to create proteins. And the proteins, of course, do a lot of work in the cell. Okay, now we're going to, for this section of the course, focus on the RNA part of all this, since we did a lot of DNA earlier. Okay, so DNA is copied to form, DNA is copied by replication, and then we form RNA by transcription, and the translation is where we produce proteins. Okay, now people sometimes get confused and use the wrong word. Please don't do that. When you say transcription, you mean production of RNA, and when you say translation, you mean production of proteins. Okay, so here's, here's the overview from a basic book that we had already. The DNA remains in the nucleus where transcription produces RNA, and then translation of the RNA produces protein. Okay, now we're going to deal mostly with eukaryotic cells. So we have to remember that the DNA is, of course, located in the nucleus, and the RNA, of course, is produced there. But in order to work to produce its protein, it needs to get out to the cytosol. And also, the eukaryotic RNA goes through a lot of modifications before it's ready to be exported to go out to the cytosol. Okay, so the primary transcript is what is formed from the DNA. And this is one long molecule that needs to have its introns removed before it's ready to go out to, to be translated. Now, one thing about gene structure that people sometimes forget is that there is a promoter there which guides RNA polymerase to transcribe the gene, but the, the promoter sequences are not themselves transcribed. They are not part of the primary transcript. Okay, and also the introns, we're going to remove those later. Those are part of the primary transcript. So you should be able to keep track of what's still there versus what's not there when we get into the cytosol. Okay, so to form the mature mRNA, we will splice them to remove the introns. We will polyadenylate them. We will put a very odd-looking 7-methylguanosine backwards onto the 5' prime end. But as well, there are other modifications which can occur in the mRNA, which, some of which we'll talk about later in the class. But in terms of the region surrounding the methyl and the cap, we can also have 2' prime methyl and other additional mRNA modifications, um, the most prevalent of which is M6-methyladenosine. Okay, so here's our generic picture of a eukaryotic gene with some of its important parts noted. Um, notice already we've got our promoter on the top line. It's in blue, and that's before, or which is to say 5 prime 2, the location where transcription actually starts. So the promoter itself guides transcription, but is not itself transcribed. And then we will produce the primary transcript, which then needs to be modified in multiple ways before it can go to the cytosol for translation. Okay, so the first modification we're going to talk about, briefly at least, is capping, where we have an unusual nucleotide at the 5' prime end of the mRNA, or the pre-mRNA. The nucleotide itself is a methylated form of guanosine, 7-methylguanosine, but the cap itself has an unusual 5' prime to 5' prime linkage between the first sugar of the first transcribed nucleotide and the um, 5', prime sugar, 5 prime carbon of the sugar of the capping nucleotide. Now, this cap is not encoded in the DNA, is it added after transcription begins to the new 5' prime end. Okay, and we've got other um, modifications which will also occur. Okay, so here's a nice picture of it, the 5' prime end of the transcript. We have our cap, which is put on sort of upside down, 5' prime to 5' prime with a triphosphate linkage, and our 7-methylguanosine is a capped nucle nucleoside. Okay, so the other modifications that can occur in the vicinity of the cap are commonly, especially in, in mammals, 2 prime O methyls on the ribose sugar and the addition of M6A on the first and sometimes second transcribed nucleotides. So here's a picture of 2 prime O methyl where we've got a methyl group attached to the 2 carbon of the first nucleotide, or it could be any nucleotide really, but for the first nucleotide of the cap. So that 2 prime OH is modified by a methylase which adds a methyl group at that position. So what that looks like here, 
we of course have our cap and we have our 2 prime O methyl there. Sometimes you can also have 2 prime O methyl at the second position in the new RNA. And the other nucleotide to notice here is adenosine, the M-sick methyl adenosine, because adenosine is modified by the addition of a methyl group. Again, that's on the first transcribed nucleotide of the new pre-mRNA. Okay, the next thing we want to consider is polyadenylation, that eukaryotic mRNAs end with a non-templated adenosines, about 200 of them. Now, what that means is that these are not part of the genomic DNA that's copied from the template. It, they're basically added um, by a non-RNA polymerase, in the sense it's dedicated to the purpose of adding this poly-8 tail in a non-templated way um, to the pre-mRNA. Okay, there are um, sequences which you don't need to really know about how this is dictated, um, but there are signals within the pre-mRNA which um, basically guide the cleavage machinery to the correct location. So we can have AAU, AAA as part of the signal where that polyadenylation should occur. Now, one thing that is important to know is that where the poly A tail is put is not actually the three prime end of the original pre mRNA. There's a cleavage event where the extreme three prime end of the pre mRNA is chopped off and the A's are added as a position of that cleavage site. Okay, now that three prime cleavage product is then degraded. So it's hard to tell where transcription actually stops sometimes because after it's chopped and the three prime end is degraded and the A's are put on, you really don't know where the actual original pre-mRNA ended. Okay, so there's recognition of the polyadenylation sequence. There's cutting about 20 nucleotides downstream and the addition of the non-templated A's by poly A polymerase which is, it is an RNA polymerase in a sense in that it produces RNA, but it doesn't use a template. So it's not strictly speaking a real RNA polymerase in that sense. Now there's a lot of other proteins involved in this cleavage machinery and recognition machinery, but this is certainly enough to know about it right now. Okay, so splicing is next, and that's gonna involve removal of introns from the pre-mRNA and ligation of the exons together to, find the final, to form the final mature mRNA that, that is then exported to the cytosol. Splicing occurs, of course, in the nucleus. Okay, again, back to our picture. We have, um, these pictures kind of lie to you in a way. They always make it look like the intron is similar in size to the exons. Um, generally speaking, introns are much larger than exons, and sometimes the exons are hard to see in the DNA sequence because the introns are so big they are removed. One thing to point out about intron removal though, there's something called a GUAG rule where the first two nucleotides of the intron are almost always GU and the last nucleotides are U almost always AG in the DNA and it would be GUAG in the um, RNA of course. Okay, the spliceosome itself is made of proteins and small RNAs. The five small RNAs are called the uRNAs, and I've never been able to figure out why. Um, and they're also called small nuclear RNAs. So these are U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6. So these uRNAs form complexes individually with proteins. And when they're complex with the proteins, they're called SNRPs or SNRMPs. So each spliceosome contains five different SNRPs, SNRPs, and there's a whole bunch of other proteins that are also involved. So there's enough proteins in the spliceosome itself to think that should do the job, but no, there are many, many, many other proteins involved in splicing, and these are just generally referred to as splicing factors. Okay, so here's just a cartoon of all the u SNRPs lined up on two introns, or two exons rather, with the intron in the middle that's getting ready to be spliced out. So the u RNAs are part of this whole process. I think I just said this, the GUAG rule for intron borders. These are the first and last nucleotides of the intron generally. Okay, the other particularly important nucleotide within the intron is an A within the intron that's going to form the branch point or lariat, which occurs during splicing. All right, so here's a picture of the mechanism, which we don't need to know. I'm showing it in order to indicate the presence of this A, this 2' hydroxyl on the A, 
which is going to be participating in the um, splicing reaction. And as a result of the first steps in the splicing reaction, it forms this odd little structure, which is referred to as the lariat. So that lariat will be removed during the splicing process, and then um, be, and that will continue. Okay, so again, the quick view of translation, we're going to talk about how we produce proteins or not. Right, so here's our picture again. After we've got our transcription, transcript being made, we've capped it, we've spliced it, we've polyadenylated it, so now it's ready to go to the cytosol for translation. Now there's something to notice about the mature mRNA, which is the one that's translating. It does not begin with the start codon. Some people insist on thinking that the first three nucleotides of the mature mRNA are the AUG where protein synthesis starts. This is absolutely not true. Please don't think that. Okay, the five prime reason of the mature mRNA is called the five prime UTR or five prime untranslated region. And those nucleotides are there for things like binding ribosomes or whatever, but they are not translated, so they don't count as codons. So you don't read your amino acid sequence beginning there. You wait till you get to the ATG that's going to, or AUG, that's going to start the translation process. Similarly, the three prime end is also not codons. There will be a stop codon at some point during the mature, within the mature mRNA, but there's a region sometimes very long which is after that, three prime to it, and that's the three prime untranslated region. And that can have very important sequences which govern things like stability or the translation, record, well, translation regulation. But again, those nucleotides are not codons and they are not read as part of the protein. It's an important concept to have. Okay, so this is what I think I just said, that you're gonna have an AUG or an ATG that starts translation and that's we're going to set the reading frame, and that tells us what protein we're going to be making, because when we start at that ATG or AUG in the RNA, we're going to read in groups of three our codons, and that will tell the ribosomes what actual amino acids we're going to be including. So we know in our genetic code there are three stop codons. There's a UAA, UAG, and UGA. So after translation starts at the AUG, the ribosomes read off in groups of three nucleotides, according to the rules of the genetic code, until an in-frame stop codon is encountered. And when that happens, a protein stops, ribosome is released, and then that will be the end of the protein. And after that is our three prime untranslated region and our poly A tail, of course. Okay, so here's a picture. I'm not sure why I put this here, but here's human insulin. It's a cDNA sequence. And we can see our ATG here near the beginning. Importantly, we can see a five prime untranslated region, right? The first part of it is before the ATG. This is the DNA form, the cDNA. And so we can see there's a five prime untranslated. And here we've got our stop codon, and it's followed by a long stretch of nucleotides. And that's the three prime untranslated region. So this is to convince you this is really true and this really happened. And you could actually mark off within this um, insulin RNA, mature RNA form, where the codons are and read them and not see any sto stop codons in frame. Oh, well, there are plenty of stop co codons out of frame. Right, so here's the rules of the genetic code. We're going to get practice later reading these in various settings in the RNA form. And it's often more convenient to use the DNA form because that's the form that these RNAs are stored in databases um, in, in their DNA form because they're usually created, cDNAs are usually created, and so your GenBank entry will include the DNA sequence, even though it's really an RNA sequence. I know that's confusing. Okay, so look at the sequence itself. You see the 5' prime UTR and the 3' prime UTR, etc. Okay, in terms of the general translation process, it will go 5' prime to 3' prime on the mRNA, which is to say it's moving towards the 3', the ribosomes are moving towards the 3' prime end of the mRNA and it goes N-terminal to C-terminal on the protein, which is to say the first amino acid, which is generally methionine, will be the first amino acid on the protein, which is to say it's got the one with the free amino group at the end. And then ribosomes proceed until stop codon. Whatever codon is immediately before that will be the C-terminal of the protein, and that um, will be the, the end of the protein by that convention. 
Okay, so when ribosomes are translating the RNA, um, usually you can see pictures of these. There's um, more than one ribosome on a particular mRNA at a particular time. And so these can actually be seen in the electron microscope where you have one RNA which is loaded with ribosomes that are moving along, making their protein. All right, so this is represented here where you can see you've got your five prime end of the mRNA, you've got your AUG, with the, in this case, the ribosome's already got both of its subunits there and ready to go. Ribosome starts moving along, and you can see the little green line here. That's your new protein, nascent protein, coming out. And of course, it gets longer and longer as the ribosome moves along the RNA. It's growing, and eventually, when the stop codon is encountered, the protein and the ribosomes are, are released, and that will be the end of the protein. So those are called polysomes. Okay, I want to say a few more words about the key players of translation, just to jog your memory just a bit, specifically the ribosomes and the tRNAs. Okay, so here's a picture of the ribosomes. Ribosomes can consist of two subunits, a large subunit and a small subunit, and both of those subunits each have RNA and proteins involved in them. So the complex of each of the large subunit is about 49 proteins, and the three RNAs that make up it. And the small subunit has about 33 proteins and one RNA. So the ribosome is always made of a complex of proteins and RNA. And then the two subunits will join together eventually to actually make the active ribosome, which is what is involved in translation. OK, so it's a very complicated molecular machine. We've got two subunits. Um, I should say the peptidyl transferase, which is to say the peptide bond, formation activity of the ribosome is actually a ribozyme, which is to say it's actually the RNA that catalyzes the reaction. And we'll talk about that at some point later on. Okay, I'm introducing this strange nomenclature right now. Um, this is a historical thing that won't go away, um, but in, in referring to things like ribosomes and ribosomal RNA, they're named according to how they behave in a ultracentrifuge. So we have S means Svedberg, which is a um, unit having to do with how fast something centrifuges, something sediments in the ultracentrifuge. And this S is not used very much anymore in too many settings, but in reference to the ribosomal proteins and RNAs, or ribosomes and RNAs, um, that is a nomenclature that is used. So, and it's confusing more because the numbers are not additive. So, for example, the 70S is a full size ribos uh, bacterial ribosome and it's ADS for eukaryote. Okay, but the two subunits of the prokaryotic 70S are 30S and 50S. Now, 30 plus 50 doesn't equal 70, but that, when you combine those two subunits, it will sediment as a 70S um, complex. Similarly, the eukaryotic ones that make up the ADS are 40S and 60S. So this is just something to sort of accept and get used to. Right. Similarly, the um, S nomenclature is used for the um, RNAs, and those are standard sizes, 18S and 28S for um, small and large subunits for eukaryotes, and we'll talk about that more later. I should point out right now about polymerases that um, RNA pol 2 is the one for proteins, okay, and um, the pol 1 is spe specified, specific for production of the ribosomal RNAs. So we have a whole RNA polymerase whose total job is to synthesize um, ribosomal RNAs. Okay, a few words about ribosomal RNAs, just a few. We could have whole days of lectures on this. But it's important to sort of know that these are processed out of a larger precursor. They're not spliced, actually. The precursor is large and it's just chopped up into bits some of which are discarded, but they're not reattached to each other the way they would during mRNA splicing. So we make, um, Paul 1 makes the RNA transcript to be the ribosome, and then we have extensive modification, especially 2 prime O methyl sugars and the formation of pseudouridines. Okay, and they, these are sequence specific that are detected by RNA guides that we might be able to talk about later. So here's a very, very simple representation of the pre-ribosomal RNA, where this is um, going to be modified extensively. 
as indicated by the little red dashes, and then chopped in a very complicated series of reactions to form the final mature ribosomal RNAs that are actually going to assemble to make the new ribosomes. Okay, so we've got our 2 prime O methyls. We have formation of pseudouridines, and we have a special system of RNAs that actually guide those modifications. Okay, this is to convince you that there's a lot of modifications. They're all over the place in the 28S RNA, for example. There's two primal methylation again. We've got our sugar. Pseudouridine is a very strange one where the uracil is no longer attached to the sugar by your standard carbon to nitrogen bond, as you normally see. Instead, it's been moved, rotated, essentially flipped, so that now your uracil is attached to the sugar by a carbon-carbon bond. And pseudouridine is very, very common in um, ribosomal RNAs and elsewhere. Okay, so in terms of a little bit of the cell biology part, this is something good to know, really, just to know, in that there are, of course, we need so many ribosomes, we can't get by with just one ribosomal RNA gene. So we have tandem um, occurrences of these ribosomal DNA regions where multiple copies of the ribosomal DNA exists in, a, in tandem clusters at specific locations on chromosomes. Okay, and they actually will, the art ribosomal um, organization or um, a synthesis, a synthesis assembly is largely done within a specialized structure within the nucleus called the nucleolus, and that is seen next to the nuclear organizer regions of the chromosomes, and that's where the ribosomal genes are located. So this is a bit of cell biology, but you should sort of kind of be aware of this, that the nucleolus itself is within the nucleus, but oddly it's not surrounded by a membrane. It's a membraneless organelle, and it is, but is still nonetheless a distinct structure. And it certainly its historical major role is in synthesis and assembly of ribosomes, but it turns out to have many other roles as well. So the nucleoli are sites for transcription of the ribosomal DNA, processing and modification of the pre-RNAs, assembly of most but not all of the ribosomal proteins, and the, basically the formation of various intermediate pre-ribosomal um, subunit particles. It's a very complex process overall. Okay, whirlwind tour here. Here's the tRNAs. We know what these are. Okay, so these are the transfer RNAs. It's their job to match the correct amino acid to the, each triplet codon in the mRNA. So these are little adapters. They're actually amazing little adapters that they work in con conjunction with amazing enzymes called amino acyl tRNA synthetases, which are specific for the, these enzymes pick up the correct amino acid and attach it to the correct tRNA for matching it to the codon. So the combination of the tRNA and the amino acyl tRNA synthetase accomplishes this amazing process whereby one type of molecular information, which is to say nucleotide sequence, becomes converted into amino acid sequence. The combination of the two is just absolutely amazing. Here's your standard picture of a tRNA, several different representations of it. The sequence is down on the bottom. Right, so here's a tRNA, and it's got a few modifications in it. There's a pseudouridine right there. Um, and then this thing, of course, folds up to form this so-called cloverleaf structure, which it resembles a cloverleaf because it has it's partially base paired to itself to form this tRNA structure. And there's other representations as well, which are much more authentic in a sense of what it looks like in three dimensions in real life. And then a simpler representation, which is used by a lot of um, cell biology books initially at least, to kind of show you, help you understand what's actually happening during the protein synthesis reaction. Okay, so here's our matching of our bunny tRNA, purple tRNA. It is, becomes attached to an amino acid at its 3' end by the correct amino acyl tRNA synthetase, and the uh, amazing tRNA synthetase knows, can recognize its desired cognate tRNAs, even though they're structurally extremely similar to one another. So it's an amazing process whereby the amino acid is attached. And as a result of this amazing process, 
we get the tRNA charged with its correct amino acid binding to the mRNA by means of its anti-codon to codon interaction. And that will be involved in protein synthesis um, by the ribosome to actually attach these amino acids one to the other to form our protein. Okay, so tRNAs are incredibly extensively modified. We've got 5-methylcytosine, inosine, 1-methylcytosine, surity, all kinds of others that are, people are still trying to figure out what each one of these does and what the effects are. Okay, I want to say a little bit about inosine right now because it's going to come up next time when we're talking about RNA editing. Inosine is an unusual um, nucleotide, nucleoside, um, which appears in various contexts that we're going to have to get straight. Okay, so here's inosine. Here's adenosine. And adenosine can be deaminated to form inosine. So adenosine deaminases, otherwise known as ADARs, catalyze that reaction. So this amino group on the adenine is removed and it's re replaced by a double bond O, forming inosine. Okay. Now the inosine is actually the nucleoside. The base itself, this is to confuse us all, the base itself is referred to as hypoxanthine. But we're, gonna, we're just going to deal with the inosine version of this. Okay, so you can see that this is going to base pair differently from the original adenosine because an amino group does not resemble whatever a double bond O in terms of what kinds of hydrogen bonds it can form. Okay, so especially important in the context of translation. And we're going to talk about different, um, different ADARs later. Um, but this is in, in the context of translation um, and the position uh, of an inosine in the anticodon region or nearby. Okay, that's a fancy way of saying that the changed base pairing properties of inosine allows it to actually read more than one codon and to get more information out of a single tRNA. So here's a representation here. Inosine is written as I, and we have a, in a, a case where this particular glycine tRNA can actually bind with three different codons. So the in presence of inosine in the anticodon allows it to bind with three different codons. It can bind by base pairing with uracil, it can bind by, by base pairing with cytosine, and also with adenosine. All right, so what this is saying to us here Here's the inosine citidine base pair. We've got our um, base pairing. And then we've got, it can base pair with uridine. It can also base pair with adenosine. So in the, in the context of a tRNA codon anticodon interaction. So that allows a single tRNA to read more than, well, in this case, three codons. All right, I think I said this. Right, so the end result of this is that because some tRNAs can read more than their exact complementary codon, you can get by. You don't need to have 61 different tRNAs for all the sense codons. Now, there's other reasons why that's also true, and we're not going to go into that right now. Um, but this is just one example that you may get the impression from earlier courses that the anticodon matches the codon exactly in the standard base pairing kind of way that you're used to seeing. Well, that's not true. There's different ways that you can get more than one codon read by the same anticodon part of the tRNA.